Oh, welcome back. It is the Entrepreneurial Thursday of the Breakfast Show on Plus TV Africa, and it's time for our hot topic. We have as guests Mukhtar Mohammed, financial analyst, Lagos State, and Dr. Frank Abagain. And we are going to be talking about uh, something that has been necessitated because Nigeria's Debt Management Office made a press release available on the 25th of April 2023 in an effort to raise concerns raised by the media regarding Nigeria's six trillion naira debt uh, to the World Bank. While it confirmed the figure quoted by the media, it clarified, however, that the loans from the World Bank come from the IDA and the IBRA, which makes it a positive development because such loans are concessional, unlike loans from the commercial banks. Gentlemen, welcome to the breakfast this morning. Uh, thank you. Good morning. All right. Do we have both of them? Because I just heard one voice. <laughs> I think it's Mukhtar for the moment. All right. So, so we have uh, Mohammed Mukhtar for now, and uh, Frank Abagan will be joining us later on. Uh, Mukhtar, Nigeria's debt has hit 49 trillion naira, and Nigeria ranks fourth on the IDA debtors list, IDA meaning International Development Association, fourth. Please explain to us, let's begin on that note, I think, why a country as Nigeria should be on that list, an OPEC nation. Let's start with that. Well, uh, good morning once again. Being on, the, uh, um, I mean, the challenge we have as a nation is not because we are on that list. Uh, uh, even the world best economy sometimes could hit um, in terms of debt. But the most challenge we have as a country is because most of our revenue is not up enough to service our debt, and our productive sector seems not to be working at all. If you look at developed economies that are into debt, America owns more than 49 trillion in terms of debt. But again, you look at their productive sector, you look at the overall revenue of their economy, you look at their um, uh, unemployment and employment rate. So, like I keep saying, be, uh, it's like when you want to grow your business, the best of business are business that are grown through debt. Uh, but again, they make sure that their revenue is above the debt. So, our major challenge is not in the 49 trillion that we are owing, it's in the, in the revenue, in the terms of what, how much do we have to pay. We are not generating enough to be able to even pay salary, talk less of paying our jobs, I mean, paying our debt. So, for now, uh, it looks a little bit better. That's why they are telling you about the lease from the World Bank that is more concession because uh, they are not going to be the one to pay it. Uh, they have concession period. They have monitoring mon mon period that they are not expected to pay anything. But again, uh, the, the future generation are going to bear the brunt of it, just like what happened when uh, the military were busy borrowing. And at the end of the day, it was the then president of, of Asunjo that came up and cleared up those debts. So it's the same thing that is happening now. Uh, it's not because oh we, we are we are not on a bad level, but we, we the government don't keep telling you that we're not on a bad level, but they don't tell you that how much revenue do we have to service debt. According to World Bank, your budget um, your budget to debt ratio should be about twenty three point something twenty two point three percent at worst twenty four percent. But what we have in Nigeria is our, our debt to 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 to, to our debt servicing plan as our, our revenue. We are using about. 86% to service debt alone. So we have gone way, way up the threshold. So there is, um, it's a big challenge. Um, and I, 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 I feel for the incoming administration. And dependence on crude oil is a major reason why uh, we have consistently underperformed in terms of revenue uh, target. How do we curtail expenditure and increase revenue, would you say? Well, when you talk about um, our dependence of crude oil has become a major challenge where we have not been able to uh, make, uh, make more um, revenue, I, I, I beg to disagree a little bit because it's not that we are not making the, um, revenue from crude oil, but what we make in terms of sales, we lose in terms of subsidy payments. Throughout last year, the, in the, the NMPC did not remit anything into the Federation account. So definitely our major cash cow, we are using it to 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 fuel our losses for other things like the subsidy payment, and which is not uh, uh, we've not seen we've not made a, a a complete structure of how we pay this subsidy, how much fuel do we consume, and all these things. So 
definitely it's not because we are not making revenue. It's because our revenue, we are using it to service our subsidy payment. So definitely that, that should be out of it. How do we begin to think of um, getting more revenue? There are two ways to get revenue into your economy. You look at the job area, then you look at the uh, 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 growth area. When you're looking at the job area, then you're looking at attracting uh, foreign direct investors, attracting portfolio investors into your economy. And by virtue of doing this, then you are creating uh, uh, jobs. But then when these companies are coming, these companies need one thing, taxes. It's either you increase your tax or you reduce your tax. It's either you use tax as a means of growing your economy or you use tax as a means of revenue. Now, for a country like ours, if it, 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 we, be, we should begin to think of how do we see tax as a means to grow our economy because we are not only suffering from the burden of um, debt payment, we are suffering from unemployment. So if you are going to bring in the major companies into the economy, then you need to begin to think how you can begin to give them tax bracket so that when they come in here, they are able to have tax bracket for five years but they will employ a lot of Nigerians. These Nigerians will, will have to pay tax. And then from those Nigerian taxes, it's a win-win situation for the government. But unfortunately, uh, when you talk about widening the tax bracket in Nigeria, you are talking about increasing more burden on the already tax. Because what we've seen is that just less than 20 to 20, less than 20% of Nigerians are really, really paying tax. 80% of Nigerians in the creative sector of the Nigerian economy, the most vibrant sector of the Nigerian economy, which is the informal sectors, do not pay tax. Why? Because that sector is government have not been able to come up with a strategy on how to begin to collect tax from the informal sector. And when we talk about the informal sector, we are talking about the National Union of Road Transport Workers. We are talking about the woman in the market. We are talking about the woman that sells in the street. We are talking about the, those are the largest employer of labor and also those, uh, they are the key drivers of the Nigerian economy. So how do we have to get revenue? You need to tax those sectors, but in taxing those sectors, you need to provide amenities for them. Because what you see in those sectors, they virtually provide everything for themselves, so they are not encouraged to even pay taxes. Um, let's, let's just um, try to get some clarity here again, um, Mukta. The government insists that the economy is still very comfortable to borrow as much as they want. And in fact, we've seen in the last five months that the borrowing has been up to like 3.73 trillion naira over the five, uh, past five months. Make it make sense to us how the economy is still comfortable. What gives them the confidence to say what they say? <laughs> the confidence they have is also in the, in the debt to GDP. And like I keep saying, debt to GDP will not pay your debt. It's debt to revenue that pays your debt. The government have, have also established that there's a challenge in revenue. But they said in terms of GDP, they are okay. So what the government is using is, is using our debt to GDP. But when you make about debt to GDP also, you're looking at, uh, like your colleague said in the studio, we're looking at our most vibrant sector, which is the oil sector. Uh, we've, been, we've been able to increase productivity. We've been able to increase production. So those are the most vibrant. That's the, in terms of that's what really grow our GDP. So once the oil sector is, is well on top, then our GDP goes. But when we talk about payment of debt, you don't pay your debt by your GDP you pay your debt with your revenue. So what we have in Nigeria, like the Minister of Finance said once or twice, he said we don't have a debt problem, we have a revenue problem. But you cannot, you cannot separate debt from revenue. It's just like a man, you can't say, oh, I have a very good job, and then you are borrowing and you are not able to pay then. That means your job is not able to meet up with your, with your debt. So the challenge we have is debt to GDP is okay, but debt to revenue, very, very poor. Okay, um, just <laughs> okay. I'm trying to I'm trying to learn as well as you know I'm not just trying to enlighten the people I'm trying to learn as well. Uh, when you say that the informal sector is not being taxed and that's why that's part of the reason why the revenue uh, is suffering. We don't have uh, taxable adults that are in the tax net already, especially the informal sector. So how does this taxation work? The woman in the market goes to the market and pay, buys ticket from like. Uh, 
five different uh, people, agencies of government and all that, and they see that as them being taxed. So how does the taxation that you're talking about work differently from what the government does to the people in the informal sector that they get this money on a daily basis from in the market, for instance? Well, when you look at the market, oh, we need to clarify, that is fee. <laughs> that is fee. Mm. So uh, it's fees that most of these fees are being uh, collected by local governments, uh, by um, associations, by... They have various names to collect those fees. At a point in Lagos, they used to pay the te television fee. Uh, be the, or if you have television, you're supposed to pay a tax on that and that and that. That is different. When you talk about taxes, tax, when you want to pay your tax, is that you look at how much income if you made after a financial year or after a monthly a month, then you now pay it. Now, there are two types of tax. There's a company income tax and there's a personal income tax. Now, for the company income tax is what you pay to the federal government and that is done whether you make your profit, then after that profit, then you, you have to pay tax. For the personal income tax, that has to do with your salary, how much when you are paid salary, and from that salary, now government remove their taxes directly from source. But for the informal sector, you are made, you are the one to go in there, tell them um, this amount. Sometimes the government have to investigate, and then you pay that taxes on your own. Like not like the formal sector that is deductible from sources. So what they are paying is fees, and which I I I, I know that a lot of people in the informal sector will say that's multi-taxing. Yes, I agree that they are paying multiple levies, not multiple tax. We should differentiate between multiple tax and multiple levy. It's multiple levy they are paying, not multiple taxes. So they need to come to a place, and that is where government need to begin to look at their structure. Do they pay taxes or do they pay levies? That is up for the government to decide. Because I, I was going to ask, in the climes where we know that tax tax is being paid by individuals and everybody in the community, that tax net is quite wide. Do they still pay the kind of levies that people pay here, the fees that you're calling them now that we pay in Nigeria? Do they pay them outside there? Or there's some kind of harmony uh, between all these ones? I, I don't know. Well, you can, say, you can say in some economy, like uh, in America, they, play, they pay pet, pet, petroleum um, um, taxes, um, I mean, based on the amount of fuel you consume. Um, they pay taxes on fuel. So, but in Nigeria, do we pay taxes on fuel? We don't do that. So, they, they still pay taxes in their I mean, They still pay some levies in spite of their or um, what you earn from your income also. So, uh, it's it's all about um, the structure that is on ground. I, I think the problem with the average Nigerian, the Nigerian businessman, is not in the payment of taxes, but it's in the in the proper use utilization of these taxes by the by the government. Most Nigerians do not trust the government when it comes to proper utilization of their taxes. And because when you look at the former sector that have been paying taxes, they will also tell you that if not that some of those money were deducted from source, most of them may not have been paying those taxes. So it has to do if you want to um, pay you if you want more people to come into the tax bracket, it's not all about going taxing more people, it's all about building uh, capacity and infrastructure. When I mean infrastructure, you know, when we talk about infrastructure these days, what the government tells us why we have to pay tax is they have built roads, they have a physical infrastructure, we have a lot of road, we have railways. This is physical infrastructure. What, yeah, what would drive the average Nigerian to begin to pay tax is when you see social infrastructure. Social infrastructure has to do with education. Social infrastructure has to do with health care. If I know that my child is going to go to a public school, which I'm not going to pay so much fee, and is going to get the best of education, it is easier for me to pay tax. If I know when I go for medicals, I can go in there and have my medicals, or not go to an hospital and they tell me, a government hospital, they tell me there's no bed and I have no option but to use the private hospital, then I am going to pay my taxes. So government should begin to think of social investment by and by, social infrastructure and via physical infrastructure. That is the way taxes are collected in developed nations of the economy. In a developed nation, there's a particular area you don't expect in a developed nation. If you are staying in Ikui, because of the kind of taxes you pay, the schools in Ikui are made better with the taxpayers' money than the people that pay taxes in Mushi, 
So you need to come up with structure that encourage people to pay taxes. And that has to come up if you are doing a lot of social investment that is reducing the cost of living of the people. But in Nigeria, what we see is that cost of living keeps going up, but the income of the people still remain the same, and in some instance, even going down. All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mukhtar Mohammed. I have been informed that our second guest, Dr. Frank Abagen, Political Economist, Department of Political Science, Bernard State University, has joined us. Hello, Dr. Abagen. Can you unmute so that we can hear you? Yes, good morning. Can you hear me now? Good morning. Good morning. You're welcome morning to the to show. You. Thank you very much. All right, so you joined us halfway, but while this discussion is going on, I've been trying to triangulate the accession of the DMO uh, that debt is good for Nigeria's development. I guess a question to also ask at this point is, would you say the purpose for collecting these debts you know, is being achieved? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that has been the major problem for our political leadership. Borrowing is not a bad thing, but it is what you use the money for. So there is um, there's very little accountability when it comes to the utilization of the funds we've assessed from the international community. If you take a look at our past history, we've borrowed a lot. But when it comes to accountability, that is where there's a deficit. We don't have, uh, you know, very good information as to what particular projects are tied to the amounts. We've tried to improve over time the midterm uh, for projects that the federal government has tried to do over time, but that has been our major problem. Tying in the funds we've borrowed from the international community because those funds are very expensive to actual projects on ground. This has been the major deficit we've had. So it's been a challenge. We've uh, always tried to ask government to provide very clear information so that we can see how much was received from our, borrower, our lenders, our international lenders, and what is on ground in terms of infrastructure or other capital projects that they've borrowed the money for. I'm just wondering, the next administration is coming on board, and we've seen this. Like I just asked uh, uh, Mukhtar before you came on, is that uh, 3.7 trillion naira has been borrowed in the, five, uh, last five, uh, the past five months. And I don't know how the next administration is going to fare. Do you think we are in for rougher times, or there's a possibility of turning the wheels in our favor? Okay, I, I, I wish I could uh, sound hopeful. It's, it's actually distressing that uh, we're in this kind of situation. And if I could recall, I think the total amount that the next government is going to inherit in terms of the total debt is $77 trillion. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit worrying. The only thing you can do is to enter new agreements with your international lenders. That's one. Then number two, we just have to get back to production. The international community is a market, but what are we producing and taking to the international market? That's the only way to get uh, foreign exchange. That's the only way to earn foreign revenue. What is Nigeria taking to the international community that this is the product that we're marketing, that, that is valuable, that people want, apart from raw crude oil? Even the raw crude, we don't set the prices for it. International market forces set the prices for that. So you can, this is the big challenge we have. But we can enter into new concessionary agreements to differ dates of payment or differ interest rates, also differ the payment packages. If we're just, let's say, yearly to pay, it could be, maybe, could, who knows, maybe $1 billion, $2 billion a year, we could decide that, please, review it downwards for us so that we can breathe. I think that's the only thing the government can do. We have to get back to production. And we have a production deficit because when you look at the international community in terms of the, the, the international trade relations we have, we, we, are, we are not going there with anything apart from crude oil. So we, we need to really get into manufacturing so that we can now have a product or two or three products that can earn us the needed revenue. With that, we'll be able to now dent the, 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 the debt profile we'll have now or else we're going to have imported inflation. It's going to put a pressure on our economy. 
is going to put a pressure on our currency. As you can see what's happening now, our international lenders who don't want to lose. So they will force us to reduce our exchange rate. It will, like the value of the Naira will still go down because they, are, they didn't give us money so that they will lose. They gave it for profit. And we have a situation now that, that people, well, our international lenders, for instance, uh, when they see that a particular debt is becoming difficult, they now sell debt to new creditors. And these creditors come with new you know, demands for servicing those loans. So uh, Nigeria has to really go back, think a little bit outside the box, because the problem is it's, it's quite serious. It is quite serious, and a major issue is being able to grow our revenue. And how do we grow that? Mm -hmm. I'd ask that question a bit. We're looking at how do we grow the revenue? How do we uh, curtail expenditure? And how do we reduce wastages in government? Let's look at this vis-a-vis -vis the ongoing crisis in Cross River State, where the sweepers have not been paid for four months. And they're talking about just 30,000 minutes. 10,000 10, naira a month, 8,500 naira a month. <laughs> now compare that to what someone has described as maximum wage being uh, paid to uh, the elites in government. Yes, um, I think it's a matter of priority here. It's um, what we, we see these kind of situations when our political leaders misplace priorities. Uh, the workers, the simple workers, if you, if you see the, the, the total amount they, they needed to take care of them is not compa nothing compared to what the political leaders take. Uh, I don't want to go into details now, but it's quite disheartening. It simply means that the value is placed more on those political holders than the workers there who are doing the work. If we want to increase revenue, there's a large section of the Nigerian economy that is not even captured. We, we have not created the right environment for a lot of businesses to grow and thrive. You need an active, small and medium scale industry structure in this country to bridge that gap. Not everybody can be a dangote or an otetola, but, so you, but there are people just slightly below that level who can move into business and create jobs and in, create revenue in the process. But the policies of government, the whole environment, and it's a bit toxic. One, the cost of doing business is extremely high. What's the cost of power and processor? How about basic structure of moving products to where they are needed and the, where the market is? We have to get back to these particulars. How about our export processing zones? They're there, but nobody's using them. If we want to earn revenue, we must get back to the drawing board. We must make these particular platforms active. They must be operative so that we have something to sell. It's like you're going to the market, you don't have anything to sell. How are you going to make revenue? Government makes its revenue from assets. The worker, the typical worker is an asset because you pay taxes to government. So you're an asset, you're providing revenue. The person who sells in the market, and I'm not talking about those who produce, who sells, based on the rentage, you pay taxes to government to inform of levies, just like my former colleague speaker has said, then you have those who are into business who pay huge uh, taxes for that. So it's a whole, you know, network. And the government has to really be serious about this. One, you have to create an enabling environment. We don't have enough power to drive the manufacturing industry in our country. So how are you going to even start? Many uh, industries have to generate their own power. Once they do that, they now claw back the cost into the product. So we're going to have a situation where you have goods that are, you know, overpriced. And the average person can't buy them. Only a small margin of the, of the, of the population can do this. So this is what we need to do. Government has to really set about creating an enabling environment. Some of those things that are basic to production have to be there. You need power. You need good roads very good roads. You need the export processing zones to be functioning so that the product we are can be taken to the international market. Once we do that, you see the revenues will go up. Well, time will not permit us to go any further. But just on a pattern yeah. note, Mukhtar, I wonder if you could respond just within one minute to this same question, because solution must be provided to all the problems that we've enumerated on this program with regards to the, the debts. Yes, the same thing Dr. I've said, I will still say that's what I said. You, you need to begin to create a 
social in, social investments, I mean social infrastructure, health and education. And then you need to get the PPP, um, uh, public partner, um, public private partnership is the way to go globally. If you bring them in there, then most of these projects that government are doing, government don't need to do them always. They need to involve the private sector. You build and operate. We've seen that work in developed countries that even have the resources. So build and operate for 25 years. And that 25 years, remember that government is still going to be taxing them based on the revenue and also those people that are working with them. So we need to look at PPP. Then we need to look at how much of social investment are we doing in our people. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mukhtar Mohammed, financial analyst, for coming on the sh uh, show and educating us, as it were. We do hope that the people who need to listen are listening right now and something needs to be done uh, without necessarily putting people in more pressure than we already are. Thank you for coming on the program today. My pleasure. Thank you. And also, Dr. Uh, Frank Abagen, thank you so much for being a part of our program this morning. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Okay. Well, we've been talking with uh, financial experts. One is Mukhtar Mohammed and uh, Dr. Frank Abagin, who is a political economist, Department of Political Science at Benue State University. We're going to take a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our second hot topic, and that will be, how do you even start a business? Where are the tools that you can find to start this business? Stay with us.